name is Nate Robinson. Uh, I am a Sniffy employee. Uh, I'm mainly working this week with the two-week party group. Uh, so you haven't seen me around a whole ton yet, but I am excited to have the opportunity to share uh, some information about United States foreign policy with you. A um, little about me, I debated for Willamette University for four years. I coached for two years at Whitman College. Um, we did very well, won a couple national championships, if I may say so. Uh, and I am uh, currently a coach at Texas Tech University, which is located, sadly, in Texas. Um, so foreign policy is one of my very favorite subjects of all time. Uh, it's got everything I love. It's got like foreign cultures and interesting foods. Uh, it's got gigantic weapons arsenals uh, and threatening enemies, uh, hopeful for global conquest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so it's basically like a big international risk game. Uh, and I'm a pretty big fan, so I'm very excited to talk with you about it today. Um, my lecture breaks down into more or less three somewhat overlapping, slightly disorganized parts. Um, first, we're going to discuss sort of the mechanics of U.S. foreign policy, who conducts it, and how they go about it. We're going to talk about some key elements of U.S. foreign policy, in particular, key relationships, who we could consider to be a, a key U.S. ally or a key U.S. friend, um, who is a potential adversary or an outright adversary. Uh, and finally, we're going to talk about some of the tools and techniques available um, in conducting foreign policy. Uh, basically, how the United States goes about uh, achieving its foreign policy objectives in the international community. Everybody with me? Sound good? Excellent. Um, we are going to need someone to serve as a button pusher, and I nominate you right there. What's your name? Yeah. Uh, sorry? Ian. Ian. Excellent. Ian. Um, when I say next, I would like you to press the right key. Like the right arrow. Cool. Let's let's give it a test. I didn't say next. Come on, go back. <laughs> next. Perfect round of applause for Ian. It was brilliantly done. Brilliantly done. Okay. Uh, so let's start with the question of what is foreign policy. And actually, before I start with this question, uh, a word about your questions. Feel free to interject at points throughout the lecture by just raising your hand. Um, I will kind of call on you as I go. It might not happen immediately. I might say, just a second, we'll give you a little partly wave down, uh, but I will come back to you, I promise. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to get through everybody's questions. So what is foreign policy? Well, foreign policy uh, is essentially how the United States federal government interacts with other states, and this is increasingly important, non-state actors. By state, of course, I don't mean one of the 50 states like Alaska or Alabama, despite the fact that both those places might seem like foreign countries. Uh, instead, I mean uh, actual foreign countries, a.k.a. states. That's how we would refer to them uh, in most international relations literature. Country and nation both have slightly different meanings. State means the actual government apparatus that controls a given geographic area. Um, diplomacy is sort of the primary instrument of foreign policy. Uh, diplomacy means like the guys uh, with diplomatic immunity, as you probably know from the movies, who actually sort of conduct business and go to meetings uh, in foreign capitals. They live in embassies, uh, and they have what seems to be a generally exciting life, but is actually quite dull, according to uh, the few of my friends who have gotten jobs in the State Department. Um, defense and military also plays a significant role in foreign policy. Uh, they are both, you know, sort of the, the big stick in foreign policy, like how you get things done, uh, but also conductors of foreign policy. In fact, the military, the United States military, is increasingly concerned uh, with operating as sort of a diplomatic agency uh, because we've come to recognize that it's very important uh, for the military to remain on good terms with countries around the world. Uh, that's how we get things done. Uh, a great example of this, two great examples of defense in action in foreign policy um, as sort of diplomats would be in Iraq, uh, where we started to recognize as part of our counterinsurgency operations that it simply wasn't feasible to have the military just go around enforcing things. The military actually had to become sort of a part of a community in order to gain the trust of the locals within that community and help to defuse like tense situations and actually turn in the bad guys. Uh, the uh, uh, failure of our military in terms of foreign policy might be found in Africa. Uh, the United States has seven, I believe, um, command centers set up around the world uh, that allow the U.S. military to sort of operate and, uh, and conduct military ops uh, in every corner of the globe. So CENTCOM, Central Command, is, uh, is the U.S. military base in charge of the Middle East. 
Okay, and it's located, I believe, in Bahrain or maybe Saudi. It used to be in Saudi. I think now it's in Bahrain. Um, the United States AFRICOM, meaning its Central African Operations Base, uh, is actually in Germany, Stuttgart, Germany, uh, because nobody in Africa really wants a giant U.S. military base there because. You know, there's some dicey stuff in the past that they're a little bit concerned about, like slavery, for example, um, and, and sort of the, the uh, United States using Africa as like a big chessboard for proxy wars with the Soviet Union for like 60 years. Um, the, the Africans are not particularly open to having a U.S. military base there, which sort of shows you the intersection of defense policy uh, and uh, the State Department diplomacy. Um, legal relationships count a whole lot in foreign policy as well. Uh, it's not just a matter of uh, you know diplomats getting things done. It's also a matter of the way our entire legal system works that has substantial diplomatic consequences. Um, this can best be seen in our trade relationships. There's an entire department of the United States government that is dedicated to ironing out trade relationships with other countries because one of our primary interests in the world is keeping trade corridors open and allowing U.S. goods and services to flow freely throughout the international marketplace. Um, Who here has heard of NAFTA? What is NAFTA? Anyone? North American Free Trade. The North American Free Trade Agreement, not Alliance. NAFTA is a trilateral free trade agreement. It's basically a deal between the United States, Canada, and Mexico um, to remove all of their sort of protectionary trade barriers like tariffs, um, import taxes, etc., um, from each other's goods so that things can move freely uh, through North America uh, at lower cost to consumers. Um, that was a very controversial policy back when it was passed in the Clinton administration. It remains controversial in many circles today, um, but it was also like a big diplomatic victory. Uh, and the United States now has free trade agreements with, um, with dozens of countries around the world. We recently, uh, I believe, ratified agreements with uh, Peru, uh, no, not Peru, Panama, uh, South Korea, and Colombia. Um, and we kind of sign more and more up every time. That's all diplomacy. Um, finally, human rights are, and environmental issues are, as you'll see, um, sort of elements of foreign policy that nobody really pays that much attention to or cares about. Um, but they are technically the purview of like the State Department. One of the things we like to say we do is promote human rights and try to save the environment. Although, interestingly, um, the United States is uh, probably one of the, what's the opposite of a leader? Not even a follower, but like a leader in the opposite direction, maybe. <laughs> uh, when it comes to environmental issues, uh, we're whatever that is, right? We're the ball and chain that's sort of dragging everything to uh, a halt. Um, the European Union and uh, even China, although to a lesser extent, have been open to uh, reducing uh, carbon emissions and signing international agreements. Uh, the Kyoto Protocol was a big negotiation that started happening in the 1990s uh, towards that very end. The United States was basically the only major power in the world uh, that didn't sign on to it uh, because, A, uh, a lot of our people are mysteriously unconvinced that global warming is a thing. Uh, and B, uh, we were really, really concerned with U.S. industry and U.S. industry lobby coming against it. As a result, we didn't pursue that priority. However, environmental issues in general uh, are certainly uh, an element of our international focus. Um, and we're not always unsuccessful. The Montreal Protocol helped ban uh, chlorofluorocarbons, which was what was punching a hole in the ozone layer. Uh, you might remember reading about that in Weekly Reader when you were a kid. Yeah. You hear about like, like Beijing and Hong Kong having like smog so bad that you can't even like, walk. Mm -hmm. We're so, yeah. we're like the ball and chain. Why don't we have any cities like that? Um, well, we definitely, uh, I mean, China surpassed us as the world leader in carbon emissions, right? Um, however, we have been more reticent to come to international agreements about reducing carbon emissions than they have. It's certainly true that China is a major, major polluter, and um, their status, Chinese industry, has been slow to sort of adapt to the international desire to reduce carbon emissions as well. Um, but China has an advantage that uh, the United States does not have. Um, the United States, as a democracy with a ton of polluters, has to listen to its polluters' interests, whereas China just has the ability, if it wants to, the central government can just do whatever they want. Um, so they're a little less beholden to the interests of polluters in the United States. It's maybe more politically feasible for them to do something more warming than us. Uh, next. Uh, so who's in charge? Who actually conducts foreign policy within the United States? It's not as simple an answer as you might think it is on uh, first glance. So first of all, the president, who is the COC, cock, commander-in-chief of the United States military, 
Um, he runs, basically runs U.S. foreign policy. And this is one of very few constitutional powers that is allotted virtually entirely to the President of the United States. Um, there is only one exception to the rule that the executive branch, meaning the U.S. Uh, president and his homies and allies, um, are in charge of running uh, foreign policy. And that is this. That the Senate has to advise and consent specifically on what? Anyone know? Yes. Um, war. War, like, true. Congress war. has to declare war. That's treaties, actually not treaties. the Senate. Senate ratifies treaties, correct. Um, and the fact that the idea of a declared war is almost passe at this point, right? Anybody know when the last declared war we fought was? Yeah. Oh, war not Vietnam. Vietnam. That was police action. No, they said in World War II against Romania. World War II. I, yeah, I guess technically Romania might be the last one. I don't know exactly what it was. But World War II. Yeah, um, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the War in Iraq, our military interventions in like 15 different countries uh, and other places in between. None of those have been actually declared conflicts. Uh, the president, it's pretty much been determined, gets to do whatever he wants with the army. Uh, as long as Congress doesn't get ticked off enough to defund it, okay? That's basically the only control that Congress really has left over the military in terms of direct control, um, like in a combat type situation. And Congress, of course, would be exceptionally unlikely to do that because that would not be supporting the troops. Um, I, I'm not being facetious, like, that's literally what they would have to do. Um, okay, so the Department of State is sort of the diplomatic office of the United States federal government. Um, they're the chief diplomats. They're the ones who run the embassies. Um, they're the ones who conduct formal talks and negotiations in most situations about most matters. Who is the current Secretary of State? John Kerry. Hillary Clinton. John Kerry, very good. The last group was slower on the uptake. They were all saying Hillary Clinton. So, oh. bravo. <coughs> bravo. Uh, Hillary Clinton, of course, stepped down uh, like six months ago, yeah. seven months ago. Um, probably to run for president, but that's what you're there. Department of Defense, they're the civilian uh, oversight of the United States military, right? Um, who is the current Secretary of Defense? Uh, was it the former CIA? Uh, yeah, Leon Panetta, very good. Leon Panetta, he used to be CIA chief, he's now Secretary of Defense, correct. Um, finally, there's the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. Um, that dude's job is basically to negotiate trade treaties with other countries. Um, but it's sort of a separate office um, that manages that. Um, and so that kind of gives you an indication of how important it is that it's an office with its own name that deserves a point up here on, uh, on this slide. Um, also worth noting that the Department of Justice and other law enforcement agencies have diplomatic ties as well. Uh, this has become increasingly important in like a post-9-11 era where we're more focused on international law enforcement cooperation to try and catch bad guys. Uh, we uh, work with other countries, we have direct ties with other countries uh, to sort of manage those relationships and make sure that we can extradite people from other countries. Extradite means, of course, uh, get their governments to arrest them and send them home so we can put them on trial. Um, who are we trying to extradite really bad right now? Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden, Edward Snowden uh, works for the NSA, leaked a whole bunch of information about how we are snooping on basically everyone on the planet. Um, maybe not even basically, maybe quite literally. Um, and uh, then fled to Hong Kong and now Russia, where he currently has asylum. Um, one of the countries, I, I think this is a really fun story, one of the countries uh, that Snowden has been uh, granted asylum in is Bolivia. Right, or at least conditional asylum. Um, he's not able to get there because we've used our diplomatic connections to shut down the world's skies for him. Um, but the Bolivians have said, yeah, sure, if you can get here, you can stay here, no problem. Um, one of the reasons the Bolivians have done this, and I think this is just wonderfully ironic, is there are about a dozen uh, former Bolivian government officials who are wanted in the United States for crimes ranging from corruption um, to probably assisting with like the torture and murder of Bolivian citizens during its military regime in the 1980s, um, who the United States has steadfastly refused to extradite to Bolivia um, for the last 20 years or so. The Bolivians are understandably somewhat miffed about this um, and have taken this opportunity to kind of stick it in the US's eye and be like, oh, really? You want to play this game? We can do that too. Um, so that is a big headache for the Department of Justice and other law enforcement agencies. Um, they do do a lot of cooperation on like counterterrorism with other agencies, though. Um, particularly the European agencies, uh, the FBI and CIA tend to work a lot with. That's part of foreign policy. Next. Oh, I didn't, didn't pick up on that. Uh, I guess not. That would feel like it would rattle me a little bit. So. 
Um, okay, let's talk about goals of US foreign policy. Um, so here's what the State Department's website says about its goals in terms of foreign policy. To promote the interests of the United States in the world. To promote the interests of the United States in the world. Um, now, the Department of State says that those interests include things like economic prosperity, human rights, peace, and security. Um, the reality of whether or not all of those statements are, are always goals uh, is somewhat murkier. Uh, most people would tell you, and by most people I mean most people who study international relations and most people who used to work in international relations for any country around the planet but no longer does, uh, will tell you that interests are whatever happens to be good for the United States. That does not necessarily mean things like human rights. We'll get into a lot of details on that matter. Just, yeah. DOS. Sorry, Department of State. DOS, Department of State. Uh, so, so the United States certainly, you know, all things being equal, wants to promote human rights and like democracy in the world. But all things are quite rarely equal, and we're certainly willing to sacrifice those goals for our primary goal, which is security. Especially in a post 9/11 world, that is the number one focus of U.S. foreign policy. Yes. Yeah, you're saying like, do we put our own economic prosperity over like, you know, the rights of like the little Chinese like slave workers? I, I think it would be very difficult to argue that we would not put our own economic interests ahead of like the interests of people in other countries. Um, now, what stance you take on that morally is extremely difficult uh, to determine, right? Uh, because on one hand, the United States federal government exists uh, because American citizens allow it to exist, right? At least that's what the social contract theorists would tell us. So of course, their job is to maximize the interests of US citizens. Um, on the other hand, a more like internationalist or cosmopolitan view might say that um, <laughs> Chinese slave workers, uh, not that many like hardcore slave workers in China these days, but let's say slave workers in like <coughs> where they really are like basically slaves. Um, certainly, you know, the United States is willing to deal with a bit of exploitation in exchange for a big payoff to itself, right? And that's just a reality of U.S. world policy. Um, I should say, too, I, I, there are multiple lenses that you can examine foreign policy through, and I'll get into that right after I take these questions. Sorry. What country is that? Uh, Burma, Myanmar. Burma. Um, okay. Yeah. I thought I said Peru, and I'm sure. Yeah, like, where are like, five little kids making like a Sony? Uh, well, there's definitely plenty in Burma, um, or Myanmar, which are in I was there this summer, too. I did not personally see any child laborers, but it's was very wildly. What? I was, I was there that winter, and I didn't see so. Well, yeah, you would have to look pretty carefully. <laughs> 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 hey, look, it's a slave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, like, it's very easy to go abroad to all sorts of places. I should say, it's very easy to go abroad to all sorts of places and, like, not see dire poverty and, and horrible conditions. You've got to kind of hunt it out. But, um, but for a source on this, I'd refer you to uh, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, uh, both of which would be more than happy to, to break down, like, a, a long list of horrible work. What are you exactly doing? I was just in Rangoon for, like, border of Thailand. Uh, okay, so, sorry, where are they? Security is the number one goal. Uh, so, uh, it has generally become the, the almost exclusive focus of the United States foreign policy to provide security for American citizens in a post nine eleven era. Um, basically, we only have so many diplomatic resources available to us, um, and in the aftermath of 9-11, the worst attack on American soil since Pearl Harbor, et cetera, et cetera, um, that has become the central focus. One of the reasons that it has become the central focus is we now live in a world of weapons of mass destruction, uh, where a single terrorist with a single nuclear weapon is capable of annihilating um, everyone and everything in a given city. Uh, so given this risk, uh, the United States has responded uh, by just pouring, pouring resources into uh, our, our own defense departments, our intelligence gathering services, and our national security services, as you probably learned a lot about in the national security lecture. Um, you should know that this is now considered very clearly our number one foreign policy priority. Uh, anything else you need to cover here? No, let's go. Uh, okay, so let's talk about key relationships and partners of the United States. It's always good to know who your friends are, particularly in debate rounds. Uh, one of the one of the sort of standard relations types argument type of arguments that you will likely encounter 
um, is a relationship they said with their friends. Sometimes this will be referred to as like allied cohesion. Um, basically, the idea is that the United States needs buddies around the world in order to get what get done its foreign policy priorities. Um, so it's useful to know who those buddies are. The first and probably most important relationship that we have is with NATO. Uh, NATO stands for what? North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Exactly. This is an organization of, it's a military alliance. That is its purpose. It's a military alliance that's formed um, basically from the core allies in World War II, and it's been adding members periodically ever since, um, kind of expanding its reach and expanding its influence. Um, it is the United States' primary uh, military partnership, uh, and it's where most of our homies hang out. We have two particularly important homies in NATO. Uh, first is the United Kingdom. Uh, the U.S. and the U.K. have what they literally refer to, like the Prime Minister of the U.K. and the President, literally refer to it as a special relationship. Um, it's like a friends with benefits thing, except there's like more feelings involved. Uh, it's basically how it is. A special relationship. What? What's involved with it? Yeah, no, it's like a friends with benefits except like this. Oh, except there are more feelings involved. Like, they genuinely seem to like each other. Um, some people, some people say, and I think in the lab last week, one of my students actually uh, reminded me of this quote that I've forgotten: that um, the United States doesn't have friends; it has interests. If there is an exception to that rule, it is the United Kingdom who might actually be our homies, um, like our, our our true like our blood brothers or whatever. I guess. Um, so, so the United Kingdom and the United States. Yes, we got off to a rocky start. We fought that whole Revolutionary War, and again in 1812. They weren't really on our side all the way until like World War One, uh, but after World War One and World War Two, they decided we were pretty legit. By we, I mean the United States. I know we're not necessarily all Americans here, um, and have been BFFs with us ever since. Um, the United States and the United Kingdom share more information probably than any other two governments on the planet. Um, there is massive intelligence sharing cooperation between the U.S. and the U.K. There's also massive defense uh, sharing between the U.S. and the U.K. We constantly, you guys have got to keep that, all right? Um, there is also uh, massive defense sharing. Like, we have um, interoperability standards um, between our, like, uh, air forces, for example, so they can conduct missions together seamlessly. Um, they work together a lot. Turkey is also a very important NATO member uh, because Turkey is the gateway to the Middle East, right? They're our primary access point to one of the most violent and one of the most important regions of the world when it comes to U.S. interests. Um, Turkey had to be courted extensively for their cooperation in the Iraq War uh, in 2003, for instance. And without Turkish cooperation, that conflict would have been much more difficult for the United States to execute because Turkey is basically how we moved uh, the bulk of our forces into the region that didn't come in on aircraft carriers through like the Persian Gulf. Uh, so Turkey, very important. We also have a lot of major non-NATO allies, yeah. Uh, is there any oil in Turkey for us, or are we just there for like, for the strategic thing? Like uh, Turkey is not a major oil exporter. I'm sure they've got some, but not a huge amount. Um, the reason that they're so important is, is literally geography, right? Um, like, we have massive forces and interests in Europe. Um, Turkey is sort of the gateway both from uh, Europe into the Middle East and also into like uh, into like that southern portion of Eastern Europe. So it was like a key flashpoint during the Cold War. Um, you might remember if you've ever like seen the movie 13 or you know about the Cuban Missile Crisis that um, one of the reasons the Soviets put missiles in Cuba and kind of sparked the whole thing was because the U.S. had nuclear missiles in Turkey, right? Um, it, so it's been a key like geostrategic flashpoint um, for a very long time, and that's why they're so important to us. More than like strategic resources, it's more like their location is nice. Um, and of course, they border Iraq, right? There are a bunch of Kurds in Iraq who also live in Turkey. So. Um, major non-NATO allies is another category of relationship that is worth knowing about. Uh, this is a formal categorization. I believe it was invented as an actual category during the Clinton administration, though I could be wrong. Um, there are about a dozen countries that meet the qualifications there. Um, all four of these are on that list. Um, and it's worth noting that um, it, it's like an official U.S. policy designation. You get some cool like bonus prizes if the U.S. declares you uh, an MNNA. Um, for one, you get to buy depleted uranium shells, um, which are just poisonous bullets, basically. Um, but they're they're like nice and useful for some reason. They're they're really good at penetrating armor on tanks and stuff like that. Um, yeah, they're they're lightly radioactive. The U.S. military claims that they have absolutely no negative health benefits if they don't 
like puncture you. Um, but like basically <laughs> everyone else in the world disagrees. Wait, is this so. yeah, are we no, they're called depleted uranium like shell casings or, or bullets. Like, if you're going to shoot bullets at a tank, you need like a really heavy, dense metal um, in order to penetrate that. Uranium is like the most abundant uh, form of metal. So it's not like in, you have to enrich uranium for like years, or well, I don't know exactly how the process works, but you have to highly enrich uranium in order to make it into a nuclear weapon. It's only very slightly radioactive in nature. Um, so depleted uranium is like old uranium that's had all of the good nuclear bomb stuff sucked out of it. Um, so it's not very radioactive, it's only slightly. But still, it'll give you cancer if the United States like dumps a whole bunch of these things over your country, which we do every five years or so. Um, <laughs> I mean, just historically, right? Like, um, Okay, so MMAs, uh, the ones that aren't on this list include like uh, Chile, I believe, is on the list, or Argentina. Argentina definitely is, maybe not Chile. Um, and a handful of other countries around the world have this designation. Uh, Thailand is another one. They are like key US partners that we want to make sure we've got their back. Um, Israel is maybe the United States' most controversial ally in the, in, in the broader world. Uh, Israel has been under fire more or less constantly in the Middle East since its creation in 1948. Um, and the United States has been its most consistent and staunchest supporter. Um, we have assisted Israel with unprecedented levels of military aid. We have supplied them with cutting edge fighter jets that we wouldn't even sell to our own grandmothers in some instances. Um, and uh, it is possible that we even helped them to develop nuclear weapons, which we have never, you guys have got to split up, I'm sorry. I need you to split up, I need someone to go over there. It's just like the, the whisper is too loud and it's distracting. I'm sure you don't mind that. Um, no, no, I need you to go sit back there. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate it. All right. Um, okay. Keep going. Oh, it's cool. I'll wait. Cool. Okay, so, Israel. Israel and the United States have this super tight relationship. They are uh, extremely close, and it's extremely controversial because virtually every other country in the Middle East, a region which we've already talked about as being exceptionally important to U.S. interests, kind of hates Israel. Okay, so this is a this is a very controversial alliance that we're made. So one of the reasons it's so tight between the United States and Israel is that the Israeli lobby uh, has a tremendous amount of power within the United States government. Um, IPAC, it's called, uh, the American-Israeli some, some Council, um, is one of the most influential lobby groups uh, in the world, uh, or in the United States, rather. Um, so they're able to persuade the U.S. Congress and the U.S. Senate to make significant contributions uh, to Israel security. Um, we also care about them quite a bit because they're the only real democracy in the Middle East, although whether or not they should really qualify as a democracy depends on your perspective, since their treatment of non-Jewish Israeli citizens uh, is somewhat suspect, right? Uh, Jimmy Carter wrote a book titled Apartheid um, about Israel-Palestine. Just so you know, there are lots of perspectives on this particular issue. Uh, Japan and South Korea are extremely important US allies. The United States is undergoing something called the Asian pivot right now. The Asian pivot means that we are shifting uh, increasingly our diplomatic and foreign policy resources out of the Middle East and towards what is perceived as the next big strategic theater, East Asia. The reason we're shifting in there is we are anticipating that China is poised to become the next global superpower. And we have two really good friends who are positioned right around China, in Japan and South Korea. Um, now, this is actually a rather hostile neighborhood for both of them. Uh, the Chinese don't much like the Japanese since that whole World War II bit where Japan unilaterally invaded them, uh, committed very, very serious atrocities uh, in mainland China, uh, and has still not really like gotten around to apologizing that much for it. Um, and South Korea also has to deal with North Korea, which is sort of the hermit kingdom. Nobody knows what the heck is going on there, but they seem to have nuclear weapons and a very large conventional army. Um, North Korea also sometimes likes to kidnap people from Japan and shoot rockets over Japan just to flex their muscles. Um, so this is like a dangerous part of the world, which is why those two countries uh, tend to like the United States quite a bit and, uh, and want to be our homies. Um, the United States has a very large military base in Okinawa, uh, which is part of Japan. We also have about 30,000 troops, give or take, uh, located in South Korea, who sort of back up the border between North and South Korea and make sure the North Koreans don't try anything. 
Those military bases are very important to U.S. strategic interests vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, they allow us to project our power into the East Asian region um, and basically serve to give us a sort of a strategic foothold uh, against any sort of Chinese aggression, which could very easily occur in a situation like Taiwan or the Senkaku Islands or any of the other disputed territories. We'll talk more about China. Uh, Colombia is our key ally in South America. Colombia is um, usually the second largest recipient of U.S. military aid. Uh, we got kind of involved with them in terms of fighting the drug war. Um, plan Colombia was a plan to spray pesticides, or not pesticides, excuse me, herbicides all over the rainforest um, to kill off cocaine production, which goes on to this day. Um, many Colombians who grow non-cocaine related crops are somewhat upset with that, but um, you know, we've got to just say no. Um, and uh, we also supply them with things like fighter jets uh, and, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Colombia has been an important ally over the past decade, given the sort of left-wing shift that we've seen in Southern, Amer in Southern America, South America. Um, there certainly hasn't been a left-wing shift in Southern America. Um, <laughs> so, so Hugo Chavez in the Bolivarian uh, Revolution um, that has also sort of taken hold in places like Ecuador and Bolivia and Nicaragua. Um, all, Colombia is sort of our counterbalance to all that. They're our friend in the region that we can count on to sort of oppose those uh, more left-wing regimes that don't particularly care for the United States. And finally, Egypt. This one has been in the news a lot lately, uh, obviously, since they keep changing their government every few months uh, and the wild protests. Egypt is extremely important to the world strategically. We have been supplying them with, uh, with military aid, and I think this is a good example of where the U.S. doesn't necessarily care that much about human rights. Hazi Mubarak, who was the leader of Egypt before this whole revolutionary stuff happened, was an unequivocal dictator. He'd been in charge for 28 years. Sure, they had elections, but um, opposition candidates had a tendency to disappear, uh, and people voted for Hazni Mubarak like 90% to nothing in many circumstances, um, despite the fact that he was about to be overthrown in a popular revolution. So reason to believe those election results were not totally honest. Um, but we still supplied him with tons of military aid. We continue to supply the military government there with tons of military aid. Um, we recently delayed a shipment of F-16s, but that's probably going to go through quietly uh, a few months down the line. Um, why are they so important? Well, number one, they're one of our very few potential allies um, to kind of rally support in the Middle East in favor of, like, Israel. And we actually are kind of paying them to not go to war with Israel again. They did it twice, uh, really destabilized the region. Well, it made us very uncomfortable. Now we make sure that their government is kind of in our back pocket and beholden to us uh, because of our military aid. In exchange, they don't go around starting wars. Make sense? Cool. Um, oh, also very important because of a very famous canal. Anyone know what it's called? Suez. Suez. Exactly. Suez connects the Red Sea and therefore the whole Indian Ocean and that like kind of part of the world um, to the Mediterranean, which is of course like the key uh, to European ports and European trade, as well as the flows of oil from the Persian Gulf into Europe, um, all of which is extremely important to us. Uh, <laughs> yeah. In fact, uh, one of the big reasons that we're friends with Egypt actually is. Uh, they give our U.S. military vessels priority access to the Suez Canal, so we get to we we just like cut you in line. Um, you have to line up at canals, right? Because we can't go through it once. Uh, and U.S. destroyers just get to zoom right to the top and, and pass on through. I imagine it must be sort of fun um, to <laughs> bypass like 57 oil tankers all lined up for days waiting for the chance to go through. Uh, okay, next. <laughs> potential adversaries. I say potential because we're not in open conflict with any of these people, but we could possibly be at like any moment. Um, Iran is the first and most obvious one that is worth talking about here. Um, the Iranians, um, actually, if you think about it, should be friends with the United States. There's like an alternate version of the Earth where Iran and the U.S. are actually pretty tight allies because um, the Iranians have a very like advanced, sophisticated culture up until we overthrew their democratic government in favor of the Shah, who would sell us oil more cheaply. Um, they had like a pretty thriving and progressive democracy. Um, they, if you look at photos of Tehran in like the late 60s and, and mid 70s, um, the people are wearing Western dress. Like the young women wear mini skirts in Tehran up until um, the Islamic Revolution in 1979. Um, the history between the US and Iran I, is quite interesting. Um, 
the Iranians in sort of the post-war era in the mid-1950s elected uh, democratically in what is like uncontestably a free election, elected a somewhat leftist president who the United States perceived as having more sympathy with the Soviet Union than he did with the United States. And the big mistake that he made is he wanted to uh, basically take more money out of the oil industry for the Iranian state and therefore, uh, at least ideally, for the Iranian people. Um, the United States obviously could not tolerate that. So um, we overthrew the regime. This was one of the first things the CIA did in the international world. And there's not even debate about it. This definitely happened. Um, we overthrew the regime and we imposed the Shah of Iran. We imposed a constitutional monarchy where there used to be a democracy. Um, and over the course of just a few years, that constitutional monarchy just turned into an ordinary dictatorship uh, with no real constitution at all. The Iranians were notably upset about this, and in 1979, um, the key power center capable of opposing the Shah happened to come um, from Islamist leaders, from like extreme fundamentalist uh, Islamist organizations. And they're the ones who took over the country and deposed the Shah uh, in 1979. It took a bunch of Americans hostage in the process. Um, and uh, they were understandably much ticked off at the United States. Um, and uh, as a result, that, that's why they took the hostages. Uh, and relations turned very sour from that point forward. Um, guess what happened in the 1980s to Iran? Anyone tell me? Nope, not sanctions, not yet. Worse than sanctions from the Iranian perspective. No one? Really? Okay, who lives right next door to Iran? Iraq. Iraq is the answer I'm looking for. Who was running Iraq at the time? And who was supplying Saddam Hussein with massive amounts of weapons and other forms of military aid? And what did Saddam Hussein know? The United States, not Russia. Um, Russia was more tied to Iran. Iraq, at the time, was tied very closely to the United States. Um, so, Iraq, Saddam Hussein, this megalomaniacal dictator, takes all of these American weapons. Uh, and what does he do with them? He attacks Iran. He tries to conquer Iran. Everyone always forgets about this. You know those photos like Cheney and Rumsfeld meeting with Saddam Hussein in like the early 1980s? If you've never seen them, you should check them out. They're cutting military aid deals. Okay, so we supply, after we overthrow the democratically elected government and impose our own dictators so we can buy oil from them more cheaply, um, they have a big Islamic revolution to throw us out of the country and get rid of the Shah that we put in charge. We immediately start supplying weapons to their worst enemy right next door who promptly turns around and attacks them. Um, not necessarily on our behalf, he was just sort of crazy, um, but, but he definitely did it with our guns and we definitely did not turn off the weapons spigot while that war was going on. And, by the way, this was the first time that Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons, aka weapons of mass destruction, which we later invaded him for. Um, so, so the Iranians, understandably, were pretty ticked off the United States by the mid-1990s um, when they started developing a nuclear weapons program. Now, in the mid-1990s, guess what happens? Excuse me, late 1990s, uh, early 2000s, guess what happens? Thank you. The 9-11 attacks happen. Yeah, we imposed a bunch of sanctions. Yes, absolutely. Shouldn't skip that part. We basically cut off their economy and attempt to bleed it dry. Um, then, in the early 2000s, 9-11 happens, okay? Um, and we declare that Iran is part of an axis of evil countries, okay? And then we immediately invade their next door neighbor to the west and their next door neighbor to the east in the space of two years. Um, we now have 17 major military bases surrounding Iran. It is somewhat understandable to me why the Iranians might feel threatened by this whole situation. Um, I have to say. At the same time, though, okay, that's one side of the story. That's one side of the story. At the same time, um, in Iran, we have a theocratic regime that has supported organizations that have conducted terrorism in the past, including Hamas and Hezbollah, um, that has publicly proclaimed on multiple occasions that it would not mind seeing Israel wiped off the face of the map, um, and that wants to develop, at least we think, nuclear weapons. So we are understandably a bit concerned about that whole situation as well. Um, there's no like one answer to this, but it's definitely worth noting the Iranian perspective. Um, let's talk about North Korea. Um, North Korea is this weird little country. Um, that's really the only way to describe it. People there are like seven inches shorter than people in South Korea, um, even though they are genetically identical in every way because they don't have enough to eat and haven't had enough to eat for about 60 years now. Um, 
they worship like the dear leader, um, right? Who is literally thought to be the incarnation, the reincarnation of the guy who conducted the Korean War back in the 1950s and still communism. Um, North Korea is extremely difficult to predict in a lot of circumstances, but it seems quite clear that their their basic idea of foreign policy is to extract as much aid as possible from the international community. Um, I, I'm completely serious here. Um, so the United States has this policy. We basically try to isolate North Korea and prevent them from doing damage as much as possible. We don't really seem to have much of a plan on how to deal with them in the long term. We can't really attack them because they've got a huge conventional military, like one of the largest standing armies in the entire world, uh, much larger than Iraq uh, and certainly Afghanistan. Um, they also have nuclear weapons. It's unclear how well those work, uh, but you know they could at least spray radioactive material over several city blocks, so we don't want them using them. Um, and they seem willing to jump into a war, like at the drop of the hat. So they're a very dangerous situation that we mostly try to diffuse, keep isolated, and um, just hope that the damage doesn't cause too many problems. Um, North Korea also gives us an interesting opportunity to work with China. Um, China is North Korea's only friend, really, aside from Mongolia, but Mongolia can't really do anything. Uh, because they're Mongolia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want Isn't me? Russia also a friend of North Korea? No, not no. really. They used to be, but they kind of got their own stuff going on. North Korea doesn't. Being friends with North Korea does not do anything for you. North Korea doesn't make anything um, besides counterfeit U.S. currency, which is like their number one source of revenue. Um, and they also like trade in illegal drugs and sell missiles to to other rogue states. That's like their whole economy. Uh, I'm not exaggerating. Um, so, so being friends with them does very little good. The only reason China does it is there are like 50 million North Koreans, and if that state were to suddenly collapse, that would be like 50 million refugees just fleeing into China because they have nowhere else to go. So China cares a lot about North Korean stability. Yeah. Do you know anything about when they like abducted two of our journalists? Um, no, not really. That, I mean, that's just kind of normal behavior for them. <laughs> no, they had this policy. They would go around like kidnapping Japanese scientists and making them come live in North Korea for like 40 years. Um, they, they did this all the time. They're just a weird little country. <laughs> um, yeah, so they're hard to deal with. No one really knows quite what to do. Bombing them doesn't really seem to be the solution because they could bomb us back. Um, oh, no. Sanctions don't seem to be having any real effect, and they're just starving people, which makes us feel kind of bad. Um, so it's just complicated. The best policy seems to be to just keep them quiet and hope they don't mess anything up too badly. The problem is they, they keep doing things like selling nuclear materials to other countries, uh, which really stresses us out. China is a potential adversary. Um, I'm going to be talking in depth about U.S.-China relations, uh, although I'm not sure what with this group or with uh, Okay, well, you guys will miss out on my wisdom there, but I will say that China is widely perceived as um, an increasingly important global player. They will soon have the largest economy in the entire world. They currently have the largest population in the entire world. Um, they consume more chicken feet than any other country in the world, um, which is, of course, a measure of international influence. Um, yeah, so China, China is a very big global player, is the point that I'm trying to make here. Um, and China is also very different from the United States. They're not a democracy. They've got an entirely different model of government. Um, they also have um, weird territorial disputes going on that the United States has a big stake in. The Senkaku Islands is one, but Taiwan is the biggest one. The United States is treaty bound to defend Taiwan. Um, under the 1979 Taiwan Relations Act, if China invades Taiwan, uh, which is like its little island that is not actually controlled by China, um, if you don't know already, um, if China were to invade it, we are treaty bound to back up Taiwan, um, which is one of the most probable scenarios for like a global um, exchange between great powers. Um, and so that automatically creates sort of a sense of enmity between the U.S. and China. However, we're also each other's leading trading partners, and tons and tons and tons of people are getting extremely wealthy on both sides of this trade relationship. So none of them really want to go to war very much. This is one of the reasons that China has not tried to take over Taiwan, and one of the reasons why we don't provoke that conflict. Um, we discourage Taiwan, for instance, from declaring independence um, to kind of keep the peace there. But this is going to be an increasingly important relationship and an increasingly conflicted one, because the U.S. and China are already at odds with one another in a number of different areas. Um, China is one of the uh, world's only suppliers of rare earth elements. 
Um, rare earth elements are like weird little metals that uh, make your cell phone vibrate and also make smart bombs fly in the right direction. Um, so they're very important. China supplies like 95% of them. Um, and China has been very reluctant to supply them to the United States and its allies um, and other electronics manufacturers like Japan over the last like five or six years. That's been a point of tension. China and the United States are also increasingly competitive for natural resources like petroleum. Um, China has invested billions of dollars in Africa, um, basically trying to make Africa um, its, one of its primary locations for resource extraction. The United States is somewhat competitive with them for influence in Africa. Um, the same is true of the Senkaku Islands and the Spratly Islands. Um, so all of these factors kind of align and suggest that this is likely to be a very, very tense relationship um, projected out into the future. It could look like another Cold War, or um, things could cool off or warm up, whichever the case would be, um, and not turn into that sort of conflict. I guess we'll see. Uh, Pakistan is also important as a potential U.S. adversary or a potential U.S. ally. It is very difficult to say things about Pakistan as a whole, because Pakistan is a very divided country. Much of the government is sort of like democratic and very progressive and forward thinking and friendly with the United States. Much of the government, however, a different portion of the government, is extremely radically anti-United States, extremely pro-Islam and an Islamist agenda, um, and is probably helping to blow things up, like American helicopters and soldiers, um, and certainly helping to support the Taliban. Um, we supply a ton of military aid to Pakistan, um, and one of the reasons that we do it is we're very concerned with who runs the Pakistani government. Who can tell me why? They have nuclear weapons. They have nuclear weapons. I don't know what a nuclear weapon is. Um, but yeah, yeah. They have nuclear weapons, okay? What's super duper scary about that? Sorry, that's just a pet peeve. I didn't mean to call you out. Everyone says nuclear. Uh, it's nuclear, but everyone will understand you regardless of what you say. But, yeah, I mean, a president of the United States says nu nuclear, so... Is our children learning? Everyone says nukes. Everyone does say yeah. nukes. This so then they just have... Um, okay, so Pakistan matters a lot because Pakistan has a bushel of nuclear weapons. Pakistan also... I said nuclear. Bush. Oh, oh. I made it funny. Um, okay, so Pakistan has a ton of nuclear weapons. They're pointed largely at India. India and Pakistan have a border dispute in the Kashmir region. They fought three wars with one another in like 50 years, and they have almost fought three more wars more recently. If they ever do, it would be extremely bad news for all of us, uh, because they would probably fire their nuclear weapons at each other. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And there are these giant mega cities like Lahore and, um, and uh, New Delhi, etc., that would just light on fire like that and produce tons and tons of radioactive soot. Um, the estimates I've heard say that it might kill everything on the planet, or it might not. It kind of depends, like, what time of year the nuclear war happens and what the wind is. Um, but it's certainly not good news uh, for anyone, uh, except maybe the deep sea vent creatures who would survive any nuclear war and therefore rise to dominance on the face of the earth uh, in the absence of all other living creatures. Um, so, I, I have this elaborate conspiracy theory about horseshoe crabs. Um, I tried to get a lecture on it, but no dice so far. <laughs> Stick with me for next year. I'll get it done. Um, <laughs> okay, so, uh, so Pakistan's very important. Al Qaeda and other non state actors, aka terrorists, are increasingly important global players. Um, these are somewhat tied to states and uh, otherwise not tied to states. So, they're very difficult to predict in a lot of instances. For example, Iran definitely supports Hezbollah, which is sort of a Lebanese militant group, um, but it also has a political arm. So is it a political party? Is it a terror organization? Nobody really knows. It's very imprecise and extremely rare. Yeah. Is Hezbollah like the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and that they're an extreme group that supports? They're not. Uh, the no, Taliban, no. the no. Taliban is like unequivocally bat guano insane, right? <laughs> like they're just bananas. Um, Hezbollah is, is much more rational, but they do have a very strong Islamist bent. Um, but they're not like, we're going to blow up 4,000 year old statues because they're not like representative of Islam anymore, uh, or stuff like that. And they're not like, we're going to stone everyone in sight. Um, they only stone like a few people. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't think that's much of a defense for throwing rocks. No, it's, it's, it's not. <laughs> it's not like I mean, it's part of their culture. 
Do what? It's like a really structured religion. Sharia, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Has yeah. Hands on those so Lebanon is super complicated too, right? Because Hezbollah is like very multifaceted as an organization. There are parts of Beirut that are controlled by Hezbollah that are like very, very much like that, like strict Sharia law instituted. There are other parts that are controlled by like more moderate parts of Hezbollah that are much closer to um, like any other sort of Arab country or any other uh, Islamic country in the Middle East, like Turkey, for example, for instance. Um, Istanbul is a pretty liberal city by the so, so it's difficult. Hezbollah is scary, but they're not nearly as like crazy scary as the Taliban, I guess is the point I mean. um, Yeah, the Taliban, no problem cutting people's hands off any part of the right? uh, Next. I just want to get to uh, a few tools of US foreign policy here in the, like, my last five, six minutes. I always budget my time poorly because I have so much fun talking about countries around the world. Uh, but go ahead and hit next. Three major tools I want to tell you about. Hard power, soft power, and economic power. You'll hear economic power defined by some people as like sticky power or smart power. Um, I think that's because academics just love coming up with new names for things uh, more than anything. Although there are some like nuances that we won't be able to cover today between sticky power and smart power, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but these would probably be the three primary tools of US foreign policy. Hard power is um, like bully power, you might think about it. It's your ability to get things done um, with the use of force or the threat of force. Um, that's basically how it boils down. Uh, an example would be uh, we want to invade Iraq, uh, or rather we don't want Saddam Hussein in power anymore. He doesn't seem to want to just step down on his own. I know, we'll use our military and just get that crap done. That is an example of the use of hard power to achieve influence in the international community. Soft power is like friendly power. Instead of like bullying your way through the world or shoving people around to get what you want, um, it's more like using persuasion and influence. Um, it's being friendly with other countries, having positive relationships, having aligned values so that everybody wants to cooperate with you. That would be soft power. And finally, economic power. Difficult to underestimate the importance of economic power. The United States is the largest economy in the world, and it shows. Um, everyone wants to be able to trade with us, which gives us the ability to extract concessions from them in exchange for access to our markets. Uh, similarly, we can give out oodles and oodles of humanitarian and other forms of financial aid uh, in exchange for favors from other countries. We are able to buy influence with other people, is basically what I'm telling you here. Yes? Is that the kind of incentive that we give North Korea? Like, like if you guys don't just destroy Japan or wherever, then, <laughs> then we'll give you, you know, these financial we use, we use kind of a combination of all three, right? We draw red lines in the sand and we say, don't you dare cross this or we'll blow the crap out of you. Uh, but if you go over here and you play nice, then you get a treat. Uh, <laughs> and that treat is like 50 bags of rice or whatever. Um, which the North Koreans probably tell their people was paid as tribute to them by the United States. Which is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding, this is true. Um, yeah. So, hard power, soft power, and economic power, all of them are tools of diplomacy. Next. Let's talk about hard power a little bit. Hard power is the ability to make other countries do what you want. The advantage to hard power for the United States is that we have tons of military strength. We spend more money on our military than uh, basically every other country combined. We're pretty close there, too. You guys had the National Security Russia, yeah? Yeah. Okay, good. You already know all that. Um, the nice thing about hard power is if you're strong enough, it always works, right? Uh, because you just win the war, and then you get to do whatever you want, including right the history books. And threats are often enough. You seldom have to actually go to war if you're going about it in the right way. Um, a great example is that we didn't want to have the same power, so we just killed him. Uh, the disadvantage is, first of all, people die. That's somewhat unpleasant. Not really that big of a concern as long as they're not your people, but still. Uh, second, there's a very big potential for backlash and blowback. Um, the United States cost itself a ton of capital with its allies and a ton of influence in the 2003 invasion of Iraq. The Dutch are still not over it, if you would believe that. <laughs> Um, Poland still got her back. Don't forget Poland. Um, I guess that there is done after your time, but that's okay. Um, but it cost the United States a ton of influence that we went around like invading countries for a few years after 9-11. Uh, people are still more suspicious of us than they otherwise might have been uh, had we not gone about that. So the Iraq War definitely had a cost in terms of foreign policy. It makes it more difficult for us to accomplish other objectives. For example, it's been difficult to get our European allies on board with more stringent sanctions against the Iranian nuclear regime, probably as a result of the Iraq War. 
they just don't trust us as much anymore, and they want to take a softer line. They don't want the United States to be NATO in any more conflicts. Um, sustainability and precedent issues, you don't want to set the precedent that you can just go around blowing up other countries uh, because you don't like the way they're behaving themselves. Um, and you probably can't do that in the long run because wars are extremely expensive, and you lack the political willpower to do so. Uh, also, trades off with soft power, that's like trade off in influence, right? Reduce influence. We'll talk about soft power, and then I'll get you out of here. So soft power is the ability to get other nations to cooperate because they like you. Um, and there are a lot of different facets of soft power. People have written papers saying that actually Hollywood and the American entertainment industry has done more for the uh, United States abroad than virtually anything else. The fact that everyone has seen Hollywood movies and, like, God help us, Miley Cyrus, um, oh, oh, seems to pave the way for U.S. relations in other countries. Even in North Korea, this is true, right? Did you guys hear about Dennis Rodman going yeah. on there? Yes. Yeah. If there is a crack in the door to North Korea and an opening for relationships, it's probably the fact that the, uh, the, the Kim family loves basketball and, like, really expensive brandy. Um, there is at least some cultural tie there, some common ground that you can have talks about. Um, so advantages to using soft power to get what you want, um, it's peaceful, and it helps build up your hard power. I can't emphasize this enough. Countries have to like you to let you build bases in their territory. As you learned in the National Security Lecture, we've got bases everywhere. Okay? When people don't like us, they take our bases away, and then we're less effective as a military. A good example is Japan, which recently kicked a bunch of our forces out of Okinawa uh, because we kept doing things like raping Japanese women um, and shooting dugongs for target practice, uh, neither of which they care for very much. Dugongs are manatee-like animals uh, that swim around in the waves. Wait, what? That's a real thing? Yeah, I love the Pokemon. <laughs> it is a Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a real thing. <laughs> Wait, you have it. What? That's a Pokemon. That's a Pokemon. But you don't have a Pokemon, <laughs> <laughs> right? Of course you know. This is blowing my mind. Okay. All right, almost wrapped up, almost wrapped up. I want to give you a really cool example. I want to give you a really cool example of soft power that I think is very important. Uh, so, U.S. universities might be one of the key channels of American soft power in history. A fantastic example of this was brought up by Joseph Nye, who is a very uh, preeminent helped to end the Cold War maybe more than anything else. Here's why. Um, if you are the son or daughter of a highly influential person in basically any country on the planet, where do you want to go to college? Yes. Probably a U.S. Ivy, maybe a place like Stanford or Duke, uh, or something along those lines. Or Berkeley, or Berkeley. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so so this, means, this means that hundreds of thousands of leaders from around the world have been educated in American schools, spent four years steeping in American values and American culture, uh, and then went back to their own countries to help lead those countries. Okay? It is very difficult to underestimate how important that was um, to the end of the Cold War, to like involving Russians with the United States and seeing that we're not all bad guys, um, and to spreading U.S. influence around the world. Um, Joseph and I wrote this article, and this is an argument you should keep in mind the next time you debate education. <coughs> Disadvantages, it's less effective than hard power because you can't just blow stuff up. It's not as speedy, again, because you can't just blow stuff up. You have to actually persuade people. And it's a lot smaller in scope because not everyone likes it. We don't have a ton of soft power with Iran, for instance, probably because we kept overthrowing their government. <laughs> um, so it's a little bit limited in scope. Um, Economic power is the thing, too. We don't have, unfortunately, time to get into it, but you can read a lot about it. On the recommended reading list that I'm about to put up on the screen, uh, if you will, next, next, and next. Next, next, next. There we go, perfect. The other stuff I already mainly talked about. So uh, these are five like preeminent IR scholars that everyone should take a look at. Um, Joseph Nye is kind of a center of the road type of guy. He believes in sort of liberalism and trying to spread American values, uh, but he also believes in U.S. power. Walter Russell Mead, uh, Kenneth Waltz, and John Mearsheimer are like hardcore pro-U.S. Let's blow them all up as long as we can do so effectively type of guys. Um, they are they have a lot of really interesting stuff to say uh, about U.S. foreign policy. 
uh, that is definitely worth checking out from sort of a more right of center perspective. Noam Chomsky is a counterbalance to all of them. He's one of the most preeminent intellectuals on the planet, um, and he is extremely critical of US foreign policy. He has the radical suggestion that we should stop blowing up other countries and instead talk with them. Um, as a result, he is extremely unpopular uh, among <laughs> these, this crowd, uh, but he's definitely worth reading for an alternative perspective as well. So check them all out at the leisure, and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs> Yeah, I thought I lost my keys. I was like, shit. Yeah. 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 Ye